I say hi, my name is Catherine Sunny. I am from Nagar, Alaska, which is located on the West Coast. Hi, my name is Esther Abraham. I'm from Hoover Bay, which is located in the west coast of Alaska. And the picture of my foot is when we had to use a heavy duty work truck to haul up my brother's foot. Hi, my name is Roy Blattergan, and I'm from Nome, Alaska. And Nome is pretty small and very desolate, which I like. And I also like going out on subsistence hunting. Hello, my name is Clara Fox. Um, I'm from uh, Shishman, and it's a small, isolated village. And that's my picture of my dog. Hello, my name is Aiden Osborne. I'm also from Nome. And an interesting fact about my hometown is that it was created originally as a gold mining town. Uh, my favorite thing to do back home is to grow my couch. Hi, my name is Dorian Levitt, and I'm from Bama, Alaska. And that picture is of me eating Motep, which is this little logo of the headbell at a spring festival in the Lincoln Cafe Center in June. Hi, my name is Jennifer Lee, and I'm from Anchorage, Alaska. And the bottom right hand picture of the view is from the flat top, which is a great hike in Anchorage. Uh, so before I introduce myself, uh, I'm introducing uh, Daisy and Emma. They were our two Chinese foreign exchange students that attended our school. Uh, unfortunately for us, and I'm sure they, were, but I'm sure they were very happy to do it. They had to go back home to China uh, instead of uh, coming here to this talk. Um, and then I am Brady Becky. I'm. This is a photo of me at a summer job on a commercial red king crab boat. Uh, I'm also from Nome. And uh, interesting things about Nome is that it uh, gets a lot of snow and the ice totally freezes and it makes for some really cool snow machine ride. <laughs> Hello, my name is Roger Huntington. I currently live in Koi, but I'm in the process of moving to Unity from my mom's shop and she is a school principal. Hola, we love, uh, I just introduced myself in my native tongue. I said hello, my name is Mackenzie. Um, I'm originally from a small village of 600 people in a small place called Indian Alaska. If you look at the bottom right hand corner picture, that is a picture of when I was around 10 years old. We were living in the Dominican Republic, and my mom forced me to dehead shrimp for dinner. <laughs> and in the beginning of it, I was completely repulsed by it. But towards the end, I like enjoyed myself. So uh, she took a picture and smiling. Um, speaking of having uh, moved uh, all throughout my life, I've moved in and out of Alaska. And during my sophomore year of my high school career, I transferred to my national high school where I. Um, I was introduced to this wonderful class called our pictures. And what we do in our classroom is that we do have a partnership, internship with Scripps, um, where we are able to come up with research projects using passive acoustics. And um, what passive acoustics are is their recordings and such from different autonomous underwater recording packages, which have come in various different types such as a heart to what it's called a soundtrack. For example, my project, I use what's called a total ray, which is a string of hydrophone tires pulled behind a cruise ship, um, a data collecting cruise ship. And 
not only do we use uh, these things, but to analyze all this from the autonomous underwater packages, we, most of us, use this program that's run through MATLAB called Triton. And we're able to visually see sounds that are recorded from the water. Um, today, we are here to present our projects. A lot of them, well, they go from all the way up in the Arctic to down here to California, um, all throughout the Pacific Ocean. And how our seminar is going to work is the first half, we're going to be uh, given the projects for the Arctic crew. We're going to have a 10 minute break, and then we're going to come back and the Pacific crew. So there's different species varies, different methods and types are used. It's actually really interesting. Um, we're going to start with Orlin and he's going to do balloons. Hi, my name is Gordon Gallagher, and my partner Daisy and I, who is a Chinese exchange student at the Montessori High School, have been analyzing long term critical <coughs> average data in which we are looking for the dolphin Aperus lupus, also known as the white whale with no dorsal fin, or as we all know, the blue whale. So we've been looking for the clicks and whistles and here are some fascinating images of the blue whale. So for some of the reasons we are analyzing their clicks and whistles is to find the effect in the presence and absence of their habitat and the blue whale are located in the Arctic. And the, as we all know, the Arctic um, ice is changing and in the future, I'd like to find out more about different changes from the ice chain, see if it affects different marine mammals, especially the beluga. And in this next um, slide, I will talk about their call range, their clicks, and their whistles. So their call range ranges from 16 kilohertz to, or from zero to low kilohertz up to 16 kilohertz, and their clicks which is in the forehead of the brain or forehead of the blue They use that for echolocation and hunting, and they use their whistles for communication. And so I will play um, a sound for you, like an example of a whistle. But first, I'd like to talk about the spectrogram in Triton, which we use. So this um, x-axis shows the time in seconds, and the y-axis shows the frequency in hertz, and all those little red um, marks on the screen is the blue whistle, and here's the sound. So, going on, um, so, <laughs> so we're going on, this is a LTSA, a long-term social average image of the clicks, and you see those big, long lines in the LTSA, that's a little click, and the x-axis shows the time in hours the y-axis shows the frequency in kilohertz. So for our location in dates, our Arctic crew is looking at um, data in site C2, which is a uh, high-frequency acoustic recording package that has been deployed to this site into the Chukchi Sea. And 
that's been going on for about 10 years. And this site is located at 170 kilometers or 105.6 miles northwest of Kyavik, or as we all know, with the farm Peru. And <coughs> this heart goes into the ocean or at about 322 meters or 1056 feet into the Chukchi Sea. And the dates of this of this deployment is in July 28, 2015 to August 5th, 2016. So for our methods, like um, as you said, we use Manlab and Triton. And in Triton, for the clicks, we use um, two hour increments with the LTSA and 30 second increments for the spectrogram to look at the calls and just to um, identify those calls and with the click or the whistles we used uh, half an hour increments and for the LTSA and 60 seconds for the spectrogram and here is the top image is an LTSA image and the bottom LTSA is a or the bottom image is a spectrogram So for our preliminary results, the x-axis is shown in hours of the day. And this number 0 is 12 a.m., the 12 is 12 p.m., and the 24 is 12 a.m. And the x-axis, or the y-axis, shows the start of the day to the end of the day of this deployment. And these little blue lines show the duration of each calls. And I will then later get into more depth of this graph in the next two slides. So for this graph, the x-axis is shown in time per month. And the, set for the first y-axis shows the numbers of calling in hours per day. And that's that black, those grayish lines in the graph. And the second um, y-axis is the mean ice concentration. So that's the blue part of this graph. And again, I will get into more detail with the next two slides. So what we have found out with um, these belugas is that during any duration of the calls from 12 a.m. to the next day, the blue is absolutely don't really care whether it's nighttime or daytime because well, we conclude that they don't really have to worry about any predators and in the future I'd like to find out if they have any predators to worry about. And in that big spot where there's very or little to no calls is the ice concentration. And in the next graph it shows more descriptively. And the funny thing, um, we had found a, a beluga whistle inside this call, so that's like, right here. That's one of the um, a beluga that has got trapped into the ice. And here's some sound of that. Kind of sounds like it's screaming for help. <laughs> <coughs> so the the blue part of this graph is the ice concentration, like I said, and that starts in November, mid-November, and ends in July. And a little bit to the right side of the graph, you can see another set of gray lines, and that's from more belugas coming in early into the Arctic, the Chukchi Sea, which where there's 100% ice concentration. And again, I'd like to figure that out in the future. And so for that call that I just played, that here's an image of the spectrogram. And the spectrogram shows the time 
in seconds on the x-axis and the y-axis to show the frequency in hertz. And I'd like to thank Scripps, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography for providing this data set for us to analyze it. It's giving us a lot of work experience. And I'd like to then pass it on to Dory Nugget, which she will get into more depth perception with the blue whistles. Thank you. There's a, there's a question about time for maybe a question. So in between the talks. Yes. When you were taking a look at the ice coverage, as you started to see the whales coming in towards the end of it, when the ice was starting to recede, yeah. did you look at, in particular, where, where were you taking the ice coverage from with respect to? Was it, was it getting closer to the heart in terms of the <coughs> water? So these blue they had came in um, near the end of the ice melting a little bit before the ice has um, fully melted and we still don't know why that happened, had happened. And like I, I said... I guess, I guess what I was asking is do you think that there was lots of room for them to not be breathing? Was the ice getting patchy there? But even though you still have pretty strong ice coverage. Um, we don't really know about that. Okay. Okay. Hi, my name is Doreen, and I'm here to present my research, which is on the accuracy repertoire of the wind whistles. And last year I had done this project, but looking at their accuracy presence in the Barrow Strait in the fall of 2013, and I found that they were more present during. September and October in 2013. So I decided to go more in depth on their whistles in that site, but within 2013 and 2014. And to do that, I used a program called Cerebral Training. And this helped me tr individually trace their whistles. And I did that for four months. And I, in total, um, traced about 4,000 missiles and um, once, we were, once I was done doing it, we started plotting them and the whole whistle is, the, the x-axis is time in seconds, the whistle is about a second long, and then the y-axis is frequency in hertz, from 600 to 1300, and we split them into subunits because we found that it was more accurate to put them into subunits because if we didn't, it would make more component types and it, we have probably a couple of hundred different type of whistle calls. So we just kind of split them up into subunits for my accuracy. And we used a program called Giphy, which is right there, colorful one. And it helped us split those subunits into different clusters based on 
their whiteness. And in fall 2013, there were about there were 3,912 bristles. And the plots are just examples of what those clusters look like. And to go more in depth, um, we made some bar graphs of fall 2013. And the y-axis is the number of subunits that happened within that order. So um, plot zero, which is at the top, is time in seconds and frequency in hertz. And that happened about 350 times. The second plot is one and four, so it took <coughs> subunits one and four and put them together. That happened about 400 times. And the third plot, three and 17, happened about two and two times, and 19 happened about 250 times. And this shows us that these are the four most common whistle types within that year in the stream. And um, oh, with bar graph, we had to filter, because there were so many calls, we had to filter out to use only 50 calls that happened over 50 times. And for fall 2014, um, I got, I, Contour turn into animal whistles. Um, a lot less than 2013. So we can't really base my results until we get more whistles for this year. And to go more in depth, for this one we had to filter out whistles that happened over 10 times. And we found that. So if you know, one, one, two, five, and five, zero happened more frequently. <coughs> and so if you have know, one up there was the only one that was similar to the previous one, to <coughs> the plot one, four. Those two were the only similar. And <coughs> like I said, we can't really say that those were the most common or that there's a difference between each year because comparing 4,000 whistles to 300 whistles is going to be really inaccurate. And so for fall 2013, we put together some, some plots and clusters Zero, four, nineteen, and two for fall twenty thirteen were the most common types of whistles that were that the whistles were making. And for fall twenty fourteen, I guess we can say cluster zero, two, five, and one were most common. Um, and since I only did two years, fall 2013, fall 2014, I think it'd be really cool to do fall 2015 and fall 2016. Like compare all of those to their on their other regions, like in the Arctic or the Bering Sea. You're in the same place, and it's a different year, and they're different whistles. So, I mean, I guess I don't know if you can answer this, but the, the interesting thing would be are these the same whales or different whales? Same whales making different whistles or different whales? What would you What would you think? Well, it's in the Bering Strait, and there are blue whales and normal whales in the 
this right? Do you think it could be some some narwhals then masquerading as pollutants? That's a possibility. Okay. Wow. Yeah. But wouldn't the clicks tell the two apart if you looked at the clicks that were associated with the whistle? Um, so Leo just takes in the whistles. Yeah, so you have to go to the same time as that whistle and say, what kind of click is it? Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a next year project. Would you be there next year? We'll be in college next year. You'll be in college? <laughs> Where are you going to college? In June. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. I would like to present Ina Osborne, who's doing our roles and frequencies. species that are closely tied to ice because they both use acoustic cells that are easy to see. We wanted to use their acoustic behavior to see how these two species responded to changes in sea ice. Narwhals, also known as Mondonomonoceris, lives mostly within the Arctic region, as shown by on the red on this range map. Bridgeseal, also known as Aramanthus barbatus, lives within the Arctic region on and around the ice. So, the heart that recruited, that recorded the acoustics of these marine mammals, was placed about 60 kilometers east of Pond Island, you can see on the right map. And this was in the Canadian Arctic, and this reported from October 2016 to August of 2017. So, my methodology when it came to examining normal clicks, I would set my LTSA to be two hours long, and I could just blaze through that. Clicks are pretty obvious, and you can just click, 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 oh, there it is. Blah. And that was my X access, and the max D frequency was. 100 uh, For narwhal whistles and bearded seal calls, I sent my LTSA to be an hour long and they can go up to 5 kilohertz. They were much bigger. Okay. So, my spectrogram I will use whenever I need to identify a call more specifically. A spectrogram would be 30 seconds long and for and it's similar to the LTSA. A narwhal, narwhal whistles and beard seal calls would be up to 5 kilohertz and things would go up to 100 kilohertz. I have some sounds. This is beard seal. The second line axis is the blue line. It is the mean ice concentration. When the blue line reaches the top, that means the entire research area is covered in ice. And when it dips down, that means that um, ice is flowing out of the way. Okay. Yeah. When the blue ice dips down, when the, sorry. When the blue line dips down, that means that pack ice is leaving the area and exposing open water. Narwhal here for much of the area is covered in ice. As you can see, this blue line, it rises up in November, and all the calls happen before that. And 
they also appear when the ice starts disappearing in July. A particular note is a call made here in December when the mean ice concentration dipped below about 50%. Okay. This graph is rid of the hourly presence of normal over a span of days from October 5th to August 4th. They stop calling in November, and as you saw in the other graph, that's when the ice starts coming in, and they start calling again in July when the ice starts melting away. And as with this graph, as you can see on the one, there is a spot around 1130 on the y-axis where the normal call. So the animation shows on and in a month of July. One frame represents one day. When the ice starts to break up around the 9th, is the normal show up in the data. The day in December when the call was made, the mean ice concentration did below 50%. Unfortunately, there was no satellite image because around that time of year, it was dark all day. From the data, I'm guessing that the Narwhal call in December, it made its way in through a loosened ice pack and was able to manage to get closer to the heart. Results for radio seal. This graph is similar to the one I went with over with the normal. The x axis is the months, the first y axis is the number of calling hours per day, and the other y axis, the blue, is the mean concentration. Beard seal is called sparsely in October and through November and disappeared with the onset of ice, which happens in between November and December. They begin to reappear in late March, and they are present almost all day up until mid-July. A particular note, if you see that red rectangle over there, is when bearded seals appear to dis disappear from the data. We'll be going over that. Okay. This other graph shows the time of day that this calls were made, the x-axis being the hours of the day, and the y-axis being the, all the time that the heart was reporting. The blue bars show what times of day the period seals called, and Beard and seal disappear from the middle of November when the mean ice concentration approaches 100%, as I was saying earlier, and reappear back in April as the ice concentration falls. From April onwards, the beard and seal will call pretty much 24 7, and they disappear some days in May. So, this animation is those couple days that the beard and seal were missing. As you can see, the heart is the red dot, and the ice has come in and packed in that area. The new ice edge is located nearly 20 kilometers further away from the heart than it was previously. So for those days, in bearded seal, the, the heart cannot become bearded seal calls. With this data, we have a baseline for how normal and mirrored seal interact with sea ice, and this can help us make predictions about in the future about how changing environments and conditions can affect the species. An example would be like the timing of the breakup of the ice and 
how and how this would affect the migration of animals. Because we saw earlier that as soon as ice broke up, the narwhals appeared. And if this were to occur like at a faster pace, sea ice is appearing a month or two months earlier, then narwhals would be in there earlier as well. And that changes the dynamic of the environment. Because their current species don't have as much time as they used to before. Thank you. So during the time where there are no calls, but did they stop calling or did they move away because of the ice cover? Are you talking about normals or area seal? I'm talking about area seals. Area seal? Um, they go with the pack ice, and at that time, like those, uh, those couple of months, Yeah, here, those couple months in between is when it's like really covered. Um, they start showing up when the pack ice starts moving yeah. around. Well, I'm talking about the, the area that you've designated with the red oh. box. Can you read the question from that? Yeah, so, so it just, you think they stayed put but just stopped calling, <coughs> or did they actually move away from that site because the ice had come in? I think they moved away. Because um, there's been interviews with hunters at Pond Inlet, and they have told us that they, that beer seal do not stick around on that best ice, which is what that turned into. So they just relocated to the new ice edge, which was a lot farther away and couldn't hear them. So going back to the narwhals, it's, it was at this point when that ice moved out. Where they kind of stopped calling. It basically put the tail off as the ice was falling and then ran back up as they started to come in, and was when the ice was totally there. I was wondering if you have any ideas as to what might be happening here. Can we repeat that question, please? Sure. So if you take a look at the, can you bring up the, um, there we go. So this one. So as we take a look at July, as the ice cover starts falling, you see that. The number of calls drops off, and in August, to, towards the end, you're, you've got nothing. Now, I know this is the previous year, but when you take a look over there, it looks, is there a gap between that? If, if we were to look at different years, is there a point where they're not calling when there's not ice? When they're not calling when there's not ice. Um, so I have not been able to look at previous year's data, but uh, what I do know is that they really love the ice edge. And when that totally disappears, you can see that it dips down in August, is when they've just gone somewhere else. But does your, does your data go all the way to the edge of that August and there's no calls in it? Or it goes to August 4th. Yeah. It's a, we, we looked at the previous year deployment for narwhals, and it's true when there is a big tree where there's no ice and no narwhal sounds in that just prior to this. Awesome. I'll be introducing Claire, who is doing that day in the seal snaps. Their face to which they get their name from. 
So, um, geographically, bearded seals are found in Arctic to Arctic regions, so that um, map you can see in the shaded gray parts of where they are found. So, as um, the ice advances, they go. To, they are found in the Bering Sea, and then as it recedes, they move to the Chukchi and the Beaufort Sea. And the sea ice is very important for them because they use it to breed, mate, molting, and also for them to uh, relax and just. And then, okay, so. Um, so, with their calls, they are. Um, only the males are known for making calls beneath the water, and they do this as a way um, of attracting mates or also maintaining a territory. And this is only during their breeding season, which is between March to July months. And then here, uh, I'll play a call for you. So you can see it kind of sounds like a And then, so um, with our, there has been a, a lot of work done by Sophie, Sophie Perry and Denise Reach, and they worked with, they also worked with the acoustics of bearded seal. And their study was over 16 years, so they had a lot of calls. And they worked in um, the Barrow region of Alaska, and the Arctic region of Canada, and then Clavard, which um, they are all circled. And the calls that they focused with were um, the four um, main categories, which were trills, and trills are have long durations, and then moans, <coughs> which are short in duration, then there was ascents, um, which are de increase in frequency, and then there was sweeps that they looked at. So with our work, for what we were doing from this past work, we were able to formulate a new method to analyze bearded seal vocal displays. Like the prior work, we generated a bearded seal repertoire, but for a completely new region where bearded seal vocal displays had yet to be investigated. In our repertoire, we didn't observe in our repertoire we didn't observe any ascents like they did because in um, the Canark area, the bearded seals don't make any ascent calls. So we so we looked at the trills, um, sweeps. And moans that the beard seals made. So the location of the harp that we that we looked at was in Kiai, the Pond Inlet, and that's located in the back, the northern Baffin Islands in Canada. And the data was from 2016 to 2017. Um, also, with in this area, it's home to the Inuit people, which um, there was a picture right there of where um, their community looks like, but they rely on um, beauty seals for a traditional means. And then there's a more clear uh, location of where the harp was, it was at. Okay, so what I did, so what we did was we looked at calls using um, what other people have used, Triton. And here's uh, one of the calls. Um, this is the second modulated call, and that's because it has a sawtooth shape, so you can see how it like cuts down and up. And so what we did was we picked a point, and then from the top point, and then to where it made one dip, and then point to each one. And the image on the right side is what you get when you're finished with the call. Four. And then when you place them over each other, this is what it would look like. And you can see how it accurately represents the call. So then after we um, looked, contoured them, then we put them 
into a file. We put all the calls of that hour into a file that's compatible to work in the program that Doreen also used, which was Gephi. And then um, with Gephi, it then clusters them. So the cluster would look like this. So each color of cluster is a different color type so that it's easier to look at. So um, the each um, so it, what we found is that the Gephi organized them into three, based them off of three um, types, which was their duration, their frequency, and their contour shape. So when we look closer at the um, the diagram, we will. This is what you would see, and it's um, each color is a <coughs> circle, and the dots represent a call, and then the lines are um, connect to the dots, and then. You can notice that some lines are thick and some are thinner, and the thickness shows how related they were to that categorizing that Gephi did. So when we look at the red cluster, what we see is we um, we chose a random set of calls, so they're not like certain calls that we chose to put into the category, um, category, and each. What we noticed is that the uh, there was a, a notch in the, the calls, but after that it just kept sweeping, swept down. And why we put a second um, part underneath is so that we can get a more sense of their relation with each other and how their frequency might be different to one, one each other. So when we look at the pink um, cluster, what we notice is that, like the other one, it's very similar to shape with the red one. Um, the only difference is it had a different um, duration than the red cluster, and the pink, the pink cluster is about, um, so it's just the duration of the cluster is different, and that's why it was put into a different category than the red cluster. And then the next one that we look, um, look at is the light blue cluster. And what we notice with this cluster is it's a lot shorter in duration than the pink and the red one, and that it was six seconds shorter. And also that the frequency range was a lot shorter, so it was from 500 to 1500 um, hertz. And also with this one, we don't see the notch in the calls that we saw in the other two. So um, what's important about the research that we did with the acoustic repertoires of bearded seal is that with the research that we are looking at, we looked at different acoustic repertoires of bearded seal, which is a vital importance <coughs> to understand their behavior and meaning tactics. And with the tactics, um, we use we can use them to better understand what may be impacting them, and be able and to better understand what may be harming them in the future. Thank you. And yet, 
that top left plot is from Svalbard, which is all the way around the other side of Greenland, where your where your your site is. And um, yeah, I just I just think that's that's remarkable. I don't know of any other sound other than those that are like Methods we used were also Matlab and Triton. 
and we have a one hour plot link for our LTSA, and then a 30 second plot link for our spectrogram. And the top one is our LTSA, and the bottom one is our spectrogram. Here are visuals of a normal and a color spectrogram. As you can see, the top is our spectrogram, and the bottom is the program. So this is a spectrogram of kilowell and normal sounds um, occurring pretty much at the same time. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to hear this. that we wanted to find out if the normal behavior change due to the appearances of the kilohertz. So for our results, we have a figure made up of normal acoustics that we collected from our data, and the x-axis represents the hours of the day, and the y-axis represents the deployment days, and the blue lines are the normal sounds, and this figure Help tell us what time of day the novels were the um, Here we have a photo here, and like Toby said, the x axis is are the hours of the day, and the y axis are the moment dates. And these line, blue lines are kilo calls, and this graph shows when during the day. So this figure is normal and kilowell calls, and again, the x-axis is the hours of the day, and the y-axis is the deployment date. So the green lines are the normal, and the blue lines are the normal, and the blue ones are the Here is our 2017 time series of the presence of both species. And here the x-axis are the deployment dates, and the y-axis are the number of detections in hours per day. Um, this graph shows us how many hours of the day there was a detection, and also the presence and absence of both normal and killer. <coughs> so we're going back to our figure of the nylon kilogram sound, and um, referring to the article earlier about the hunters being interviewed, saying that they started seeing more kilograms up in the north, it means that the kilograms are moving from the south up to the north. And this figure helps support that because it shows that there's kilograms and normal in the same place in the Arctic. And also, it helps show us that the normal behavior didn't change pretty dramatically because. Um, that was a very, like, they have a lot of sounds within 20 hours a day, they don't care day and night because they don't really have that many predators. But when the kill are the present, they are almost completely silent. And we think it's because the kill have been attacking and eating the normal since they showed up. So we think that when the kill are present, the normal kind of stay low and don't make any noises to stay safe. And also, some hunters said that they witnessed the normals like move to the sides of the water and um, move into more heavily ice covered areas when the soil is present. So why is it important? It's important because the kilograms have rarely ever been in this part of the Arctic before. 
And the narwhals have a new predator to worry about that they didn't have before because the killer whales are starting to stick around for like months and that they're not coming in and out, they're starting to stick around. And it's also important because the ice storm is changing immensely, which is the reason to begin with why the killer whales are interesting to see how well they are able to navigate the ice. The narwhals seem to move closer to the ice edge, maybe killer whales can't navigate the ice as well as the narwhals can. Yeah. <laughs> Your analysis is only of the whistles, right? Um, we did all the sounds. Like every sound we found. So when the killer whales are present, was there any difference in terms of narwhal whistling versus narwhal clicking? There, it's about the same whether the killer whales, because there is a period where they kind of overlap. Yeah, narwhal, when they overlap, the narwhals, they just stay the same. Like, they didn't change what kind of sounds they're making. I mean, it's a bit more aggressive, but it was still like very. One of the hunters that you refer to in here, um, do you know this information or, or, or how do they react to the studies and findings that you have here? Or, or have they even seen them? Um, I'm not sure. The, 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 hunters, uh, the hunters and trappers organization in Pond um, will get a report on this in the summer when we're up doing the Refurbishing the instruments, and so they haven't they haven't actually seen this. We did a report to the HTO in March just a couple of months ago, showed some preliminary analyses, played through the sounds, showed a little bit of that, and there was a lot of interest. Yeah, and there was a lot of a lot of uh, insight, a lot of stories on uh, watching killer whales eat narwhals this last season. This is how um, how we have got the the kind of Reports of narwhals going closer to shore and whatnot. That was I mean, that was some of the most fascinating information here is that it's not only your sort of scientific data, but the whole way the cultural information makes us a really interesting presentation overall. Those two combined are fascinating together. It'd be nice if one of you could come up to find in the news story you're using. You could do this presentation for that. You could. <laughs>
by John T. Lee, who um, recorded President Killer Wells in the British Columbia. And he actually discovered that um, Killer Wells are, have distinct calls to their distinct pod. So you can actually listen to their calls and figure out where they're from and where they're coming from based on the kind of calls that they're making. And so like in comparison, kind of relate this back to like how humans um, like react. Like, like say like an Australian person, they have an Australian accent and an American has an Australian accent. And you can kind of like listen to them, you can figure out where they're from based on their accent. And the same is with four parents, you can figure out their accent. And so the calls are very important to um, to the most because they mean different things for them. Like for example, echolocation, which is used primarily for their, um, to figure out where their, the orientation and then also to find their prey. And then there's also whistles, which is the high frequency sound, which is typically used in the, in the social context. And then lastly, the pulse calls, which are more of a, play a role in the coordination of behaviors and the maintenance of group coordinations. But um, within each of the calls, they kind of have more within them. And then, so for the um, for the the hard location that I did was in the um, Low Islands, and the start date was August twenty fourth, twenty first, two thousand seventeen, and the end date was September twenty eighth, two thousand seventeen, and it recorded. Um, a <coughs> The methods I used for um, my project were I first logged all the calls that I um, found in the data and then I created JPEGs of each of the pictures. So on the first one is the LTSA, which was set in a length of one hour. So on the y axis is the frequency in hertz, which is um, set at 5000 hertz. And then on the um, x axis is the time in hours. And then the bottom is the spectrogram, which um, the y-axis is 800 hertz, and then the x-axis is time in seconds. And, and next, I created um, the folders of each of the calls and kind of divided them up into each of the folders. So some of the calls, this was one of the calls that I found, and um, this one was more of a um, side-banded one. So it was very like close together, and it also had like a little bit of a um, a curve to it. It was kind of like N shaped, and then it so it was also close together. And then this is what the um, call sounded like.
with listening to kind of rock calls, you can kind of figure out where they're coming from. So it'd be kind of cool to like listen to all these all the things um, that are recorded and try to figure out where they're coming from. And then it would also be cool to figure out like the calls that are combined. Like, is it like two orphans I can call, or is it just one? So it'd be kind of cool to figure out if there's like a because I noticed like in this there was like a repetition that was happening. Because it made one call from the same call a couple of seconds later. You can see kind of here this one. There's like two of the same type of call. So we kind of go to figure out like what's going on there. So, thank you. Question? And then we're going to take a quick break. There may be some unconfirmed. Sure. Okay, refreshments. <laughs> And then for, for those of you who can stay, we'll have a, a second session and uh, the students will present their work on another part of the world ocean. So, questions? Were those recordings from Pondedland as well? Yeah. yeah. Um, no, they're from the Little description that we heard in the last talk that the hunters uh, say that the killer whales are going after Carwall. Yeah. So that that would mean that they would be transient type. Mm -hmm. But would there also be resident type, you know, fish eating type present? Is it is there that idea that there'd be a mixture of even types in this spot? Uh, I'm not quite sure. It's actually not clear what population this is. Um, that's kind of where, where everybody stands on this. Mm -hmm. The question is who are they still? Is anyone going to give some photo ID? There's a, the, so Canadian Department of Fisheries Oceans is going to have a camp set up this <coughs> summer for that whole, most of the open water season, really near where the, these recordings are going to be clips out. So they're going to be tagging narwhals, but they're also going to be out doing what the killer whales are going to do. They anticipate some more. If I can comment on John's question, my, uh, one of the papers I read recently is that we're just beginning to see this speciation event where we're seeing marine mammal specialists and fish specialists starting to separate in the Arctic. <coughs> divided into two categories. The first is non-song, and the second is song. Non-song vocalizations are typically about uh, socialization, uh, about whales talking to each other and conversing. And then they also, non other non-song acoustics include feeding, whether it be to affect prey behavior or to cooperate with each other while they're doing uh, group feeding. They also communicate with each other while they're doing their Migrations during the summer, humpback whales feed in the north, and then during the winter, most of them migrate to Hawaii, with a few going to the west coast of Mexico, and a few are still going over to Japan and Philippines. And then the other part of the humpback acoustics is song, and a uh, humpback song is when there are repeated phrases that make up themes which constitute the song, and so that is done by humpback males in the breeding grounds as a social, as a way of forming social networks. So the methods of the data that I went through was that there was a sound trap instant to sound 
recording for about six days, uh, six days of data over the course of a week. Um, in this diagram here, or in this map here, you can see the first deployment, which was in uh, what was what is called Eastern Channel, and the second was in uh, about Mid Channel. And I can't really point to it because it's sort of not me. I can use the maps, but just to point out where our school is. This is the city of Sitka, and then our school is right about here. Um, I don't know how that is. Um, so the results, my, our, the data that I went through was that we did a, I did a presence and absence study, and so on the x-axis you can see this is the time of day, 12 being noon, 24 being midnight, and 0 being midnight again. The y-axis is the date. The data started on the 19th of November, kind of on the tail end of it, like around 11 o'clock, and then went, got, I got until November 24th. The blue represents the presence of a humpback call during that time, and you can see that there's a gap there between around noon and three-ish. Um, this is a typical tonal call, kind of the, the sound that I would hear while I was going through data. I'll just play it for you. second segments of sound from the files. On the x-axis you have time, time being 30 seconds in this situation, and then on the y you have hertz. The color represents the intensity of the, the, intensity of the noise. Uh, yeah, and so you can see in the blue there on the, you're right, that's the, again, the diagram showing the presence of the calls similar to this. Um, and then so this, I'm just going to play this, this is a spectrogram of about, uh, this is a spectrogram of about 20 minutes long and it has humpback songs, specifically the song that I'm going to play is in this, this orange, that orange box you see there. Like we, can, we cannot, as of right now, go back and say, 
we know they were seeing in the past because this is the first time we recorded it. So now we can go. Now we have this baseline where we can say, you know, we know they were seeing on these dates, and then it created a lot of like I said, it created a lot of questions about why they were seeing. So the next steps would be to uh, compare and identify uh, where this whale was coming from because each breeding area for humpbacks has their own specific song, which with their own specific phrases and units. So theoretically, we should be able to look at the song that we, that we have, and then go through the songs in each of these locations and compare them to be able to identify where this whale was coming from and where it was going. Um, we want to know where there are multiple whales calling, how often have these whales been calling uh, per day or per week or per month, and then how long have they been doing this for. And so in that we can determine was this just an isolated incident, or have they been doing this for a long time we just don't know, and how long will they be doing this for in the future. And then if there are multiple whales calling, we'd like to be able to look at that and say, you know, determine where these whales are coming from, and if there's any cultural transmission of song occurring, as in uh, swapping with phrases and units to create a more evolved and uh, yeah, a more evolved song. And then a few just like preemptive guesses about why these humpbacks could be singing. Well, the first could be that uh, they were practicing their song. This was in November, right before they began their migration for the winter. And it could be that they're just practicing their song. More specifically, it could be a prepubescent male who uh, has never sung before practicing their song. It could be that the whale is trying to establish a social relationship prior to the migration, as in um, just forming sort of uh, preemptive uh, social networks with other whales before they travel. Or it could simply be that the whale is doing it for fun. Whales have been known to do things for fun before, and it could simply be that this whale was having fun singing. Um, and so what we need is ideally we need to record for longer than a week. And so the best thing that, the best possible scenario would be that we would get a harp and sick sound, just so that we could be able to look through a longer period of time and be able to determine whether there's more song going on, whether there are more whales singing, and just answer all these questions that we have to better understand uh, these wonderful marine animals that we have right next to our school. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions? So yeah. if you could go back to the map from uh, the, that one. Yeah. It looks like from these visual data that you would say that the singer probably originated in Hawaii or in Mexico. And so it would be kind of interesting to get recordings from the same season. I don't know whether that means, you know, the, the winter before or the winter after, or maybe, you know. So as of uh, right now, we do have, we have recorded with uh, Janice Strait of UAS. Uh -huh. um, and she's provided me with some song from, was it February and March of this year? Yeah, February and March of this year, down in Hawaii. Uh -huh. uh, we have yet to compare it, however, I'm looking forward to doing that next year. Yeah, so the other one, if you could get, because there, there are some researchers who are working mm -hmm. up Mexico now, so those are kind of your two options. Yeah, that, that would appear to be the most uh, likely scenario. So, so. Aaron also, the guy that's already said it, it's more than one of the All right, uh, if that is all, uh, I would like to introduce, altering from the humpback feeding grounds to the humpback breeding grounds, uh, Jasmine and Esther on their presentation of false killer whales in Kauai. Um, bears are in the and their common name is 
it's um, a little white patch on their neck. And they typically live in tropical waters. However, our focus is in Hawaii. False killer whales typically eat yellows and tuna, albacore, and mahi-mahi. They compete with the fisheries down in Hawaii for these fish, and as a result, it, there is an economic loss for the fishermen and for the killer whales that are being caught as bycatch in the long runs. The reason for our research is because there has only been visual ob observations done for our false killer whales, and we want to look Scripps wants to look a little more closely at the acoustic behavior and the absence of presence of these animals to better protect their environment. And, and this picture right here, it shows the great characteristics. And previous researchers described their critics to have a below And the white figure below that blue one shows exactly that. The um, y axis shows the amplitude of the clip, and the x axis shows the frequency. All scale whistles are from their maximum and minimum frequency is 6.1 kilohertz and 4 points of kilohertz. The duration is 0.4 seconds. And this is important because we're able to identify most of the whistles through those parameters, and it varies from other species such as dolphins. <coughs> In this slide, it shows the instrument used to record the data, and it is called a hot or a high frequency. And between this island and Kauai is where our data is deployed. And the duration of our report, I mean, scripts script report was from early June to late August of 2019. shows a potential false killer that's in the source. And we apply the below 20 kilohertz peak frequency of which we use in our research and we are going to use it for our presentation. So as I said before, we logged the potential false killer amounts which is seen in the blue figure I love, which is that LTSA, and in the figure below is a clip spectrum, and the dotted one is a short wing pilot whale, which also clicks with a peak frequency of 20 kilohertz or below, and a false color whale is the dashed line, and the solid blue line comes from the click average that we found in the blue figure above. And that is average now, and compared to these that are found in the Oswald paper. And we compared these clicks that we found at 20 kilohertz or below. And the first, the top one is a potential false killer whale, while the other one is a different species. <laughs> this map shows the Hawaii area, and that we found this Hawaii. The yellow line shows the satellite information of which species and the left <laughs> hand side shows the false killer whale like the rugby dolphin and it's on like in our deployment area. And we could use this information to identify This is important because some 
scientists have disagreed about the visual characteristics and the acoustic characteristics because of, as you see in the previous slide, a lot of the satellite tags show that row two dolphins are in that area opposed to false photos. And we wanted to further identify whether or not it was false or we looking <coughs> These are three of the 12 parameters that we took from the awful game party. The y, y axis shows frequency while the x axis shows the spaces and the And in the maximum frequency, it shows uh, four to Research, we initially started with the click char characteristics of the false killer whales, and we logged those. And as we continued on with our research, we looked at the whistle characteristics just to verify that our click character, our click samples were matching to the false killer whales. And we used the parameters provided by the Oswald paper to verify this with the maximum frequency, the minimum frequency, and the duration of these clicks. Unfortunately, they, there was a lot of species that clicked and whistled around the same as false code world, which made it a little bit difficult with just starting off with using the clicks in the beginning. And so in the future, we're hoping just to use whistles or a combination of clicks and whistles just to better understand the false code killer whales and better protect the environment, which gives us a little insight on the false code. However, the whistles have more parameters and like the differences between the species whistles like have more distinct characteristics and we would like to use it even though it would take longer and be better for our future research. Thank you. See if I understand though, but when you compare the spectral shape of the clips, they match the false killer whale pretty well. Is that right? Yes. But then the whistles didn't necessarily match what Julie Oswald had said. Right. So to me, I would trust the clicks more because it's all about the geometry of the forehead of the animal, which is something they really can't change. You know, it's it's the the spectrum of the, of the click is all about you know, how big their melon is and that kind of thing. Whereas the whistles, they can do whatever whistle they want. And so, so me personally, which is my bias, is that the clicks are probably a better metric than the whistles. What? Well, we also found that the, the short pink pilot whales also clicked around that frequency below 20 kilohertz, so it's kind of hard to differentiate which ones were clicking. So that we took it a step further and looked at their whistle characteristics just to ensure that it was the most kind of yeah. those clicks. Can you go back to the slides that show the spectral shape of the clicks? So and, and so you've got the well, scalar whales and you've got the pilot whales or right? Yes. And so the, the whales have that little bump. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Is it a dash line that shows the potential wall skill where the wings while the docking line shows the like another species of And I also we went back to the disagreement about the scientists. In this figure, it shows that both kilo aren't visually seen there, but close to the rough tooth dolphin that makes the similar place. Yeah, except these this is only a couple of animals, right? It's, it's not the whole population. So, I, you know, this says that at least you know that they're close by, but I wouldn't take this as the final word in terms of their complete distribution. Or the coping within our research, there's some false chemicals in there. Also, there aren't only false kilograms and rock dolphins in the area, so yeah. we kind of just lose those two because they had more similar. Do you know, um, I see it in your Instagram. Do you, do you know what the band width is of the, um, the false killer whale whistles versus the rough tooth dolphin whistles? Like the frequency range in which you might find their whistle sounds. <coughs> their whistle sounds? Uh huh. Yeah, so like the minimum and the maximum frequency of those. Well, here you go. So minimum these two figures show that the false killer whale bandwidth is much more shorter than the rough tooth dolphins. Yeah, I ask because um, <coughs> it does look like the rough tooth dolphins and presumably the uh, pilot whales, etc., have a bigger bandwidth. And this is a really small bandwidth for the false killer whale whistles. And can you go to that spec of the LTSA where you show the an hour or two of the Clicks and whistles. There. That's just um. Do you, did you think that these are have a sense of whether these are muscular whales or not? Initially, since we were initially looking at their their clicks, we were basically we were kind of orienting ourselves with that, and the whistles showed. Yeah. I mean, the clicks show that range. It's just interesting how banded the whistles are here. Right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people, that just seems yeah. unusual. They're alive. So, so, species. Yeah. so something that they did figure out the difference between the species is that there's more variation in the rugby belt and whistles. And these definitely don't have a lot of variation in the whistles. So this, it, it suggests that these could be possible in whales, but maybe all the detections they went through, you know, some maybe were false killer whales and might still be some of the dolphins in there. Yeah, I like this. this. This suggests that your method of combining the whistle <coughs> characteristics with the whistle characteristics may give you a little more strength in figuring out what it is. I have a question um, in regards to how you measure the, the, the characteristics of the whistles. Um, we use the Oswald paper to identify whether or not that they were potential Oh, I'm not even talking about classification. I'm talking about how, did you manually pick the minimum, maximum, and the duration? No, we had our scientists that guide us with this research. Yeah, we use Silvio. And measure the minimum and maximum of the whistles that were injected in Silvido. And so here's my follow up question to that. Um, Silvido is known to split whistles into smaller chunks and sometimes doesn't capture it all in one swoop. And I stumbled over your duration measure. Did you guys at all look at uh, whether you had? Um, full whistles that you actually measured from start to end? No, we they didn't review all of them. Okay. But did you review some of it? Mm -hmm. And so you had the impression that you actually captured the whole whistle? Yeah. Because the duration measure did fit the expected duration, whereas the other frequency components did not. That's right. But you're using metrics from Oswald as well. And so her methods could be quite different. 
And there's some other differences with Zelda's about golf. Um, so you might take a note. Yes. Um, the Oswald paper used only like a small population of hospital whales. And you think that's like one of the very big variables that like open that classification? I kind of, I personally think that duration depends on like where the whales are coming from. So, go ahead. Um, we also heard from the also where it kind of depended on the type, the pod that these came from because these are matrilineal animals and they kind of stick within their pod, their pods, and they have a different type of like or less or that. From the migrating from the Hawaii Islands into the Mariana, Mariana Trench, there's Robert. There are three types of beaked whales in the area. The plain bills and cuvier beaked whale are confirmed to be in the area through visual and acoustic data. While the ginkgo tooth beaked whale, well, whale is suspected to be in the area because of acoustic data that is indicating that it is also in the area. Beaked whales are deep divers. To give you some perspective, the deepest humans have gone by themselves is 330 meters scuba diving. By comparison, beak wells can reach depths of 2,991 meters, close to 10,000 feet deep. And we look at the, as many other, Odon, or all other Odon seats have a form of navigation and origin, or a form of sonar that they use for navigation for origin, which is their clicking. And the big whales click are polycyclic, which means that many different cycles can go up and down the model in a single click. <clears throat> Moving on to dolphins, there are four types of dolphins in the area. The bottlenose dolphin, the spinner dolphin, the pantropical spotted dolphin, and the false little whale. And I group these together because of the way they're Clicks are formed, which are impulsive, very few cycles. Sonar. All the dogs seek to use a form of sonar known as echolocation for navigation and foraging. Another type of sonar is mid frequency active sonar. And 
sonar is used by the Navy to look for submarines to map the bottom of the ocean floor and to navigate underwater. And an unintended consequence of this is that there have, or odontics have been known to be affected, especially weak wells, by this sonar, and it is unknown whether it's caused, whether it is, whether it confuses them or whether it is painful to them, and either of those can be the cause of the meetings. For the data, I looked through the data provided by Scopes Institution of Oceanography the, through June 15, 2014 to October 20, 2014, at the East Harp located 1,000 meters down, just east of Tinian just west of the Mariana Trench in the Northern Mariana Islands. For clicks, the y-axis is frequency and filters, and x-axis is time and hours. And I look for clicks between 0 and 9 kilohertz, and the um, Intensity is shown by the color, dark blue being uh, high intensity, dark red being really high intensity. And this is an example of some of the dolphin clicks that I found. And for sonar, the, I looked for sonar in the frequency range of 0 to 10 kilohertz. And time and hours, and this is an example of the sonar I found in the area. Results. Uh, as you can see in this graph, there are a, there is an x-axis and a y-axis. The x-axis is the local time in 24-hour time, with the gray shaded out being night. The y-axis is time in weeks throughout the data that I scanned. The blue is the dolphin clicks and the duration, and the red is the sonar, and as you can see, the sonar is only active for part of the year. And as you can also see, the dolphins are far more active at night than during the day. Here is the same graph, except for beak whales. This next graph that I'm going to show you is the weekly average number of clicks before, during, and after sonar was present in the area. Before sonar is represented by red, during sonar is represented by green, and after sonar is represented by blue. And you can see a sharp drop while sonar is active, <coughs> and it roughly returns to normal after sonar. Here is the same graph for dolphins, and there is a noticeable drop that is not as drastic. Nocturnal odontics. Why are the odontics more active for cooking at night? This is because of dialectal migration, where their prey migrates from deeper depths to the surface at night to prey on what they eat to reduce the risk of visual predation. And they return to these deeper depths during the day to avoid that. And why does those, and do marine mammals in the area avoid or click less often when the sonar is active? It is pretty obvious that they do, seeing as how goes from just over 100 average click, clicks per week and to under 50 and it roughly returns back when sonar is gone. And I thought that was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can you go back to the 
back to the flat ratio of the time of day and the sonar and the daylight. There was a really clear, uh, at a glance, you could see with the, the dolphin, presumably dolphin species, that there's just this clearly clicking during the night and, and not as much during the day. Um, have you have you looked at this at all to to determine whether there's some significant change for beach whales in night versus day? Um, it it might be that the beach whales need to expend less energy on hunting, so they spend more time cooking during doing active hunting at night. One of the things that sort of jumps out is the duration of the encounters. That the encounters at night look to be longer than the encounters during the day. But maybe that's be something good to look at. To test if there's a difference. I I think it's because like since it's during the night time they have to live longer and they use their clicks to see. And I think that's why. They have to see that. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, another noticeable thing is there's absolutely no overlap between beach wells and sonar. So anytime sonar is active, it seems there's absolutely no sound from beach wells. So, so one, this is just getting into conjecture or whatever, but at night the scattered layer is higher up. So it may be that you can spend more time foraging on it because you're not diving so deep whereas during the day. But, but you know, peak wells, we don't know if they forage on the scattered layer or not, but in the day it would be deeper down, and so that might be why the patterns are shorter. But I'm just throwing that out there as a hypothesis, but it does look like if you look at the duration of the encounter, it might change. Is there some, is there some tag data for showing the <laughs> pattern? Yeah, there's, 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 there's none. So there, they don't change much. Well, they start foraging a little bit higher in the water column at night. Um, so that goes towards having this opportunistic bite as they start diving. But they still dive just as deep to their preferred dive depths at night and day. And they do that during the night and during the day regardless. Is this mostly cumulates or what kinds of big girls are these? Um, yeah. But they're, 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 it's probably majority of uh, There was a paper I read that I'm blanking on the exact data, but it showed that there was, in one of the locations, there was more activity from one type of beaked whale than the other types. And I, I know, right now I'm unsure whether what's the is what the is. It was the QBAs, yeah. I don't believe it was in the location. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, the TDA location had more QBA.
this is the white side and reverse of something. And I had, was talking in, like, what can I get this year with these dolphins? All kind of stuff. And she had a cup of coffee given. I said, that sounds cool. Like, what is this thing? And so, cup of coffee stands for California Cooperative Ocean Fisheries Investigations. It was established in 1949 when the fishermen here in Southern California had seen a significant decrease in their sighting population and they wanted to know why. So, they invested money into uh, did the research for this and they, uh, the program, which is called Coffee, is um, partnerships with Scripps, NOAA, and the California Fisheries and Wildlife Services. And so what they did is um, they went around Southern California, as you can see, um, all of these gray lines, they start all the way up in, uh, right above San Diego, and they go out and about and all the way around to right above Point Conception. And through this, they, um, what they did is they collected data from, they collected hydrographic data and different types of biological data. And with this, uh, you're able, this kind of data present, uh, presents opportunities to ask questions about entire species and their responses to variabilities um, with, and in comparison to the time. So, <coughs> the kind of data that I use were passive acoustics, which um, was collected through the total rate, which is a string of hydrophones pulled together and pulled out uh, behind the cruise ship 300 meters away. Um, and other data that was presented was biological data, such different things, such as tow nets, um, CTDs, and other types of nets as well. So my questions were, uh, what are the dolphins increasingly present, and what drives the seasonal shifts in the dolphin distribution? So one of my dolphins that I study and I'm continuing to study uh, are the Lagonarchus of liquidants, commonly known as specific white-sided dolphins, or what I like to call them as lags, seem shorter than that common name. Um, they range anywhere in the Pacific, and their diet mainly pertains to squid, herring, and sardine. You're able to identify these dolphins by looking at their peak frequencies, which are at 22 kilohertz, 27.5 kilohertz, <laughs> the other dolphin I uh, am studying is a Cornelius, which is also known as the Rizzo dolphin. They are they have cosmopolitan range anywhere in places that don't have much cold water. Um, their diet is anchovy, octopus, squid, and cuttlefish. You can visually identify them by looking at their peak frequencies at 22, 25, 30, and 90 kilos. And and knowing all of what I knew, and given this opportunity to look at cow coffee data, I was able to look at three different years. Um, and the cow coffee cruise data is quarter annually, so four times a year, once a season, they go out and they collect all these types of data. And um, in this, in this little graph thing here, um, it shows you in blue which um, when the data I could the one. I could use the acoustic data, um, and the white represents when the data wasn't very visible and I wasn't able to use it to identify the levels. Um, and again, they went along these gray arrows, and the toad array was towed between the circles. So the circles each represent a different station where they would stop, and they didn't want to interfere with the, uh, the hydrographic data, so they'd stop recording once they got to to a station. Um, I was able to go through and look at all these uh, all these dolphins looking at the clips, um, but first before I was able to be able to do that, we filtered them out using an automatic detector. So it went through and it detected all the clips and I was able to sort through the clips using this MATLAB-based program called DataEdit. And in DataEdit, um, because it's not only just dolphin clicks, there are other types of clicks and click types in there too. So I would have to filter them out. Um, 
And one of the most common things I did see in the data, besides notebooks, were um, echo centers. And echo centers have a very monotone, very straightforward line of key frequencies. And so as you can see in the red, uh, that boxed out, those are echo centers. And we painted them in different colors so that they filter out. You can see the difference between the dolphin clicks and echo centers. And you're able to see that in this peak frequency. So the red line again does represent the echo centers, and the blue represents the click of a dolphin. And we identified this particular click to be a lag because of the peak frequencies at 22, 27.5, and 39. So I went through all three years and all 12 seasons together to come up with a map. So in this map, um, it shows this is all three years of data put together. There were only four counters of Pacific wide sided dolphins. And in this, um, there were, because there were only four detections, there was no correlation between each season. So we couldn't really pull anything out from that. And for the Rizzo's, what we were able to pull out for this that was during the springtime, they were mostly offshore and more far out, not near shore at all. Summer, they were slowly uh, making their way inshore, but not all the way. The fall time, they'd pull out a little bit. Um, and we couldn't, from this, the, from the acoustic data, we couldn't see, we couldn't say anything about the winter time because we only had one encounter with them. But what um, last year's project used a harp instead of Twitter data, and what we found was that they're more inland and more onshore because they follow the squid. So, um, I compared my acoustic data to um, the visual data of the Campbell et al. 2015 paper, and in their paper they had made similar graphs is where I got like my folder to it, I guess you could say. Um, so I compared my acoustics to their visuals, and what I found is that during the springtime for the lives, that they were always scattered around, they had no particular place on shore or that. During the summer they were around the islands of uh, Southern California. And in the fall and winter, there was no correlation whatsoever. Um, unfortunately, they did not have any. They did not have any um, maps or anything like that for the Rizzo's dolphin. So I can only compare them to. I can only compare the labs. was a very unusual year because of the El Nino and also the warm blob, right? So it was a time where there were in general fewer animals, you know, offshore here than most years. So it's kind of interesting. I mean, I think your results, if we expanded your results to other years, because we thought, you know, more than 10 years in Kampaki, I think that time period you worked on is, is very unusual, but but interesting because of that. You'll see animals not in places where they normally would be. But, yeah, but it's encouraging to <laughs> find them you know, from the Twitter right there. I'm curious now uh, about the amount of data that you analyze. So you have 12 seasons or 12 different cruises. Do you have any idea of that? Is that approximately? How big is that? How many hours of, of uh, total rate recordings was it that you were looking at? Um, I'm not exactly sure because when I got the data, it was already uh, gone through the automatic detector. Okay. So it didn't take long to go through all of that data. I'm going to say, well, I'm going to say this. Um, this particular one I'm presenting only took about a month to do. I had done a lot more research pertaining to other Kalpati data, such as like visual observations, because we saw this other dolphins, like 
found more of these weird dolphins. It's like, what are they? So we like, looked into that. We looked in, took, and made, made maps and hooked off the website to like, different uh, species of eggs and all this kind of stuff. But with the time limit, I was only able to present to you this day. Wow. So it's really impressive you're looking at that fast. That says a lot about What would you change in the program dead edit? If you could filter out like, anthropogenic versus like that would be so much better. If the anthropogenic were just go out before you even saw it. Yeah. <laughs> it saved so much more time. Yeah. I don't have any more questions. Um, so as I said before, I am a year two intern. And um, last year, we had given Mr. Mahoney this little award that said that's death. And so I just wanted to continue on this kind of thing. And so I kind of wrote this was like maybe like almost three more last night. I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> to his guys, um, at least once in every teacher's career, they tell a student that they're not here to be their friend. Um, and I believe this is true. And having the only three times in my high school career, I've heard him say it about once or twice. And I do believe it. Like, he's not a friend. He is there to teach me. But <laughs> not only does he teach us like science and like, oh God, does, does he just coach the volleyball girls, how to volleyball or anything like that, he teaches us some life lessons, such as that coffee keeps you sane and sometimes. <laughs> Um, that if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. And other things that if you're not okay with where you are, like in any of your projects and your grades and your class and stuff, that you can help you get there. And with this, um, to me and the other students uh, in the management community, he's like father of this. And funny story, last year on this trip, he, he was called our dad, like he think. Some lady legit thought he was our father. <laughs> so we got to more or less. And um, yeah, so he's like, it's like dad and so And I just want everybody to like know that he puts so much time, so much effort into his students and his work and his passion about all of this. And uh, the day before we got here, I'm not able for like three minutes. And I followed up to Mr. Gwen's class. And I had him help me make some things. So let's try this one. I'm going to move up here. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> if Mr. Gwen's involved, I'm definitely nervous. Can I still have something to say? You wrapped it very well. <laughs> Good, I don't want to teach you anymore. <laughs> so every day when I take attendance, I say, raise your hand if you're not here. And then every student that raises their hand, I'm like, good, I don't want to teach you anyway. And they didn't know because they weren't there. <laughs> so, anyway, thank you. <laughs> I like to say, hey, we're, we, Mr. Mahoney and I are the same age. Uh, but in some ways, you are my dad, too, so. <laughs> I'll be right models at any age. You certainly are, are going to be. It's a true pleasure to work with you. Thank you, too. Thank you for bringing all these uh, hardworking, capable, intelligent young people into our lives every year, over and over again. And thank you to all of you for all the work that you've done. It's really impressive. I would say, if, if somebody blundered in, they, they didn't know what this, the presentations are about, but they just wanted in. I'm pretty sure they could easily think that these were scripts graduate students, or you know, from some class that's being taught here, and these are the, the projects. That there's no way that someone would think that these are high school students. I mean, the, the, the quality of the presentations, you know, are what you expect maybe in. You know, at least college students are maybe graduate school. So, uh, 
It's impressive. Job you guys. And, and you know, there, there are things in these presentations that no one knows outside of this room. I mean, they're, they're new information that, you know, we just learned today from the work that was done. So that's, that's impressive. Well, we would, we would like to, uh, to continue that work. We have two HARP interns here that are now in a race to see who can be the first HARP intern to be a first to offer. Wow. So they're going to take it on again next year and see what, they, see what they can do. But thank you so much for coming, uh, and thank you so much uh, for supporting us and our students at Mount Edgecombe. Uh, it's very hard for them to leave their homes and, and come to our school, and uh, I really enjoy sharing just a little bit of the, the special time that I get with these young students and, uh, and the, the work that we do with the, the Wheel Acoustics Lab here. It's something that's very important to us. It's very important to our school, and it's talked about by our administration frequently at advisory board meetings and the State Board of Education. So it's well known that, uh, that we receive a lot of support. And the type of support that we get is different than we can get in any other aspect of science. And we see it so often at the high school level, especially, where people will come into our classroom Say, well, if you go to school for a really long time, you can do science with us too. And, and your lab has done just a phenomenal job of saying, you know, throwing that method out and saying, do the science with us now and be a scientist and learn how it's done. And that's it's, it's really special. So thank you. Well, it's, it's really, you know, it's like it takes a village. Someone said, it's here or whatever. But, but the, so many people want to be involved in this project because of the value. You know, I mean, it's, there are a lot of people that contribute, and, and that's because it's, it's important to everybody on both sides. And I want to say that Professor Rex, who's yeah, supported you know, the, the project and, and has said that you know, he wants to keep it going as well. So it's all, it's all we all do our part to. to uh, make something that's really great. Well, I want to say thank you to the people of Barrow Village who 65 years ago made a lot of research possible. So the, this is nothing more than the reciprocation of the hospitality of the people who live with this part of the world. And uh, we admire what they've been able to do. Thank you. I'll be sure to pass that on. I have a question. How is the day you work? How do you work with the students? Like, you gather together in the class and then you process the data for the different projects. Same time, or what would you do that? We meet uh, five days a week, Monday through Friday, for an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, and uh, this year, we spent, uh, I, I think, just about every day of the week, there was one one or more researcher from Scripps or other organizations that was Skyping with our students. Uh, and it was just phenomenal. Uh, students would disappear, not always to Mr. Quinn's class, but they would disappear out in the hallway. We're so and so, oh, they're Skyping with, you know, with the scientists. And it was just the support was phenomenal, and, and the, the result that we got from that support was, it was clear this year for sure. Uh, the, what we learned from this data this year was really, really exciting. So, so do you do you have to work with these guys? We noticed that and you pointed it out that the projects are sophisticated this year and they're and they're quite um, they're bigger in scope and they're they're fairly complete, many of them. Yeah. And one of the differences this year is that um, so Anne uh, joined again and co you know um, directed our our part here. But we also had a number of other students. So Eden is now doing an internship after her undergraduate. Um, she's you know, considering a career in green mammal stuff. And so she worked you know, tirelessly on the Bearded Seal project with Claire, who's always there. Mm -hmm. Kate Frazier, um, down in postdoc, she uh, helped with that project and with another one as well. Jessica, who's right behind you, you may remember from your marine mammal class you know, a year ago. <laughs> and she was working with the killer whales and narwhals. And, uh, and Peter Fee, who's in the back, is a master's student, 
<clears throat> and he's been, if you heard the sounds and you like what you heard, Peter was, was the students were all sending sounds to Peter and he was uh, producing them and making them sound good and getting ready and working with them to get them into their presentations. So we had, we had eight people in total at Scripps um, who were working directly with the students. And so um, that was probably one of the main differences this year. Mm -hmm. Undergraduate students, yep. postdocs, staff, all levels, and that, yep. that also makes And when things don't work, um, we still have screws. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is true. Yeah. yeah, well, and you've conquered the world also. I mean, with the variety of you know, Hawaii, Southern California, you know, Canada, Alaska. I think having, having more of your students and, and staff involved really, really allows that. And, and this relationship that we fostered is it's causing other teachers at our school. Uh, Ms. Joel Mall is now teaching a field research class, very similar, you know, based on the, the way that we put our carpet and the CTAC crew together. And she's got tons of kids going out in the community doing a lot of local work. Uh, we have other researchers that want to start partnering with us and trying to replicate this type of outreach in, in a very different way than trying to find a bunch of kids to scan the data for you. <laughs> so it's, it's been a lot of fun. And school says they'll cost share on her. So if we can... <laughs> Back to that. This is, this is a hard sell. <laughs> so, what, do we have, what do we have to do to get a data logger in Mr. Mommy's check bag uh, uh, Thursday morning? Otherwise, we're going to you're going to have to call Dr. Stafford and ask if they can borrow the soundtrack. Did you want to show that to the show to get time to show Oh, anyone who has five minutes and wants to see a video that the uh, school put together on CTEC, stick around. So, uh, one of our uh, teachers and good friends with uh, Josh is uh, Paul Fitzgibbon. He runs a news outfit, a video news outfit for our school called Cutting Edge. They put out episodes every you know, week or two weeks or three weeks, somewhere in there. and. Uh, they did an episode on the Harpenter class. And so, you know, we'll find that. Yeah, this is a constant reminder that I could probably stand a little bit older. Get older, get shaved. We have a positive answer for high school. We have a teacher program, and we work with high school students, and we partner with the Whale Acoustics Lab at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. I'm Michael Mahoney. I'm a uh, teacher at Mountain High School. My name is Ann Thomas, and I'm a research associate with NOAA, and I also work part time with the Board of Science Education at the National Academies. My name is Josh Jones, and I'm a PhD candidate in biological oceanography at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Uh, so <laughs> researching for the ocean listed in Canada. I'm Kelly Popple. We're researching the rocks and killer whales, and we want to know why there's killer whales in a place that they've never been before, and also why they're killing the rocks. Uh, my name is Robert Huffington. I've been working with data in the Pacific Ocean on the edge of the Mariana Trench, scanning through data, looking for reef whales and other seeds, as well as possible summer activity. That is back in Wales. I am Audrey Wilcox and I'm doing archives in Canada and specifically I'm doing the Ocean Arts and it's going to be doing years 2016 to 2017 and I'm looking at the calls and comparing them to other archives. Uh, hello, I'm Claire Wilcox and I'm working with the Pod Inlet data from 2017 and I'm using contour lines to look at the different pitches and bearded seal calls. Hi, I'm Orlando Lagerman, and we're looking through our Arctic data from 2010 to 2010. I'm looking for the clicking counters. And my name is Daisy, and I'm looking for the bubbling souls for almost 10 years. My name is Zori Leda, and I'm from Bear, Alaska, and my research is on blue whales, and I'm located in the Arctic. My name is Ian Osborne, no. My name is Emma from China. We're studying the Canadian Arctic, specifically we're looking at the presence and absence of narwhals and bearded seal. Hello, my name is Dr. Abraham, 
my personal library, I'm Jabs and I'm from Anchorage. A project is on an app called Killer Wells because they're an endangered species and we can have their clips. Uh, my name is Randy Mankey, I'm uh, going through Combat Royal Data that was taken right here in Sika, just over there at Royal Park. This experience is really important for students because it allows um, people to learn about what data in the real world looks like, what research actually involves. Uh, it's not always clean, data is always messy, and there's a lot of variation. Uh, it's important to us as Alaskans because many of the animals that we're researching are important uh, culturally and important for subsistence food and uh, making clothing and a number of other uh, really important uh, cultural aspects. I think the art mentoring program is uh, important because we create opportunities for young people to participate meaningfully in research um, before even getting into their undergraduate and, and other educations. And from the science standpoint, our research programs benefit significantly. We get a lot more science done when we have more people working. It's started this wonderful relationship that we've had for 10 years now that uh, students are working with uh, researchers uh, studying the acoustics of the sounds that green metals make under the water. And uh, we've been traveling down to San Diego and uh, we present our research to the scientists down there. Having this experience, students can, um, I'm not going to tell all of them to necessarily be professional scientists, but I hope that they are able to use their personal thinking skills that we develop through this sort of work. I mean, the decisions that they make about their life, their health, or the well being of their communities. And one unique opportunity that we have with heart injury in Alaska is that many of the students who we get to collaborate with um, uh, on Arctic research have direct experience and a long exposure to the animals themselves. There are students who are from communities um, where their families and they themselves sometimes have grown up specific hunting these animals like both and whales, belugas, and bearded seals. Um, and so many of the students really have a special insight into uh, what's going on with examples. If you are a student that's interested in taking the art intern class, you don't have to take the class uh, just to be a bioacquisition. Uh, one of the best parts of this class is that you get to meet a lot of different types of researchers and the, the connections that you can make with other scientists is a great way to maybe create a spark for you. And this is not science out of a book. This is actual research. This is new stuff the world doesn't know. So I think that's a really, really good part of this class is being able to, to learn new things and learn how science works. <laughs>